The actual discovery of the piezoelectric effect stems back to the mid-1800s. Two French brothers, Jacques and Pierre Curie, are credited with making the breakthrough when they proved that applying pressure on these piezoelectric materials created electricity. Pierre was the brother who seemed to shine in all aspects of education. He was outstanding in mathematics, and at the early age of 16, he was attending the Sorbonne for University Studies. At the early age of 20, Pierre, along with his brother Jacques, began conducting experiments with special attention dedicated to crystal structure. When the time came for the Curie brothers to begin their experimenting, they really believed that the crudest of materials would generate the results that they were looking for. They first started with tinfoil, glue, wire, magnets, and even something as simple as a jeweler's saw. With this, they began testing different types of crystals. They used quartz, topaz, cane sugar, Rochelle salt, and tourmaline. Their experiments found that when these materials were compressed, the mechanical strain applied was producing a potential for electricity. They further evaluated their materials and found that quartz and Rochelle salt had the strongest effects. Of the naturally occurring crystals that the Curry brothers tested, quartz is the most commonly used crystal today. It can be found in everything from watches to electronic circuits. This is due to its reliability and controllable behavior when an electrical current is applied to it. About a year after the Curry brothers discovered their piezoelectric effect, a mathematician named Gabriel Lipman argued that there was also a reverse piezoelectric effect. He stated that when an electric field is applied to a crystal, the material will deform in response. When the Curry brothers got word of this discovery, they quickly got to work and wanted to test out Lippmann's theory. They determined that he was in fact correct, that piezoelectricity could very well work in the opposite direction. But due to this theory being so mathematically involved, it never really developed into anything more. In fact, research on piezoelectricity pretty much was non-existent for the next 30 years. The Curry brothers obviously encountered some setbacks along the way, but in April of 1880, piezoelectricity was given its official name by the Minerologique Society of France. Thanks to the hard work and dedication of the Curie brothers, ultrasound has become a huge asset to the medical world today. Piezoelectricity is the real backbone of how ultrasound works, and advancements have taken place over the years. The piezoelectric element is a crucial piece of what an ultrasound transducer needs to be able to function. Materials used to make piezoelectric crystals for ultrasound have changed over the years. In earlier days, quartz, lithium sulfate, and barium titanate went into transducer construction. Today, these materials are hardly ever used due to them having a high impedance. Body tissue is much lower, so this results in a high acoustic impedance mismatch, which then results in poor transmission of the acoustics. More powerful materials are now used. Those include zirconate titanate, lead titanate, and lead metaniabate. Zirconate titanate is currently the desired material of choice for today's ultrasound transducer construction. Touching specifically on how piezoelectric crystals function in an ultrasound transducer, on both sides of the piezoelectric element, electrodes are fixed into place and a voltage is applied. A vibration occurs as a result, which causes the crystals to expand and contract. In turn, a sound wave is then produced. The thickness of the transducer crystal is a key element in ultrasound operation. The thicker the crystal, the longer it takes to expand and contract. A slower compression rate of a crystal results in a lower operating frequency of the transducer. Conversely, the thinner the crystal, the faster the compression rate, resulting in a higher operating frequency of the transducer. Original ultrasound transducers were large and bulky. About 64 crystal elements were contained in a single probe arranged in a linear row. It wasn't until the early 1980s that smaller probes with improved resolution were made available for use. 
Instead of 64 crystals, about 128 crystals were being placed in a single probe. Currently, ultrasound transducers consist of a piezoelectric element, backing material, an acoustic matching layer, and an acoustic lens. All of these components help to improve the efficiency of the crystal, decrease the impedance mismatch, and improve the resolution of our ultrasound images. Okay, today we're gonna to do a little experiment where we're going to make a natural piezoelectric material called uh, sodium potassium tartrate, also known as Rochelle salt. It's actually pretty easy to make and uses two fairly common ingredients, the first of which is sodium bicarbonate or soda ash, which is found at uh, art supply stores where it's used as a dye fixer, and cream of tartar or potassium bitartrate, which is found in the spice section of your grocery store. We're gonna take our seven ounces of the cream of tartar and we're gonna add it to a cup of water, but I'm using a two cup container so that we have some room because then we're gonna take it, oh, messy. We're gonna take it and um, mix it on a so stove top in a pot of simmering water. Okay, so when the water around your saucepan is simmering up to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, then we're going to add a half teaspoon of the soda ash. And you'll see we'll get quite a reaction, quite a bubbly reaction. We're going to let it calm down a little bit, and we're going to stir, and we'll keep repeating this. It can take quite a while. We're going to keep adding half teaspoon by half teaspoon. So eventually it'll stop bubbling and turn clear. And that's when you know you're done. Okay, then with the mixture still warm, we're gonna pour it through a coffee filter into another glass container. This can take a little while. We're just making sure we get out all of any clumps or undiluted parts. So after letting the mixture cool for a little bit, we're gonna pour it into a plastic storage container. And then we'll cover it loosely with a lid and we'll just let it sit in a cool place overnight to see if we get some crystals. You can also, um, if the overnight doesn't work immediately, you can store it for up to two more days in the refrigerator to 
to see if you get some crystals that way. Okay, so we stored them overnight in the garage actually to keep it cool. And then um, another half a day in the refrigerator and it looks like we got some crystals, lots of crystals actually, though most of them are pretty small. But we're gonna search through here, dry them off, the big pieces we can find and see what'll work for testing them out. Okay, so although we had a lot of crystals in them, most of them were pretty tiny. These are still kind of tiny, but there were big clumps of tiny little crystals that would break up too much when we tried to test them. So we've got a few here that we're gonna test out and, and see what kind of response we get. Okay, we're gonna test out our little piezoelectric crystal. We've got it hooked up to a voltmeter here. So we're gonna show that when mechanical stimulation or vibration is put on it, it has an electrical response. 